So according to the description of this next session, Grant McFadden from Trends calls Illusion Audio the secret weapon. I'm curious about why, what, what he means by that because from what I see, this is a lineup that certainly deserves your attention. It's got some really key, unique uh, features and uh, we're going we're gonna to dive right in. So let's bring Grant McFadder up from Trends Electronics once again. What's going Grant? on, Ben? Uh, the secret weapon, you say? Uh, yeah, I think it is. I mean, it's it's got some really cool technology to to talk about uh, from a retail standpoint. Um, it's not just talk; it's actually there for a reason. And I have some very unique products that are that'll fit in applications that other speakers won't or won't fit easily in uh, because of those design characteristics of it. So yeah, I think it's a bit of a secret weapon because we don't we don't uh, offer this, we don't go wide in the distribution of this product. We keep it exclusive. Oh, okay. Um, so there's not a wide distribution so we can maintain the high integrity of the product and the margins. And uh, you know, Al Alan's uh, a key part of this product. I believe he was the head engineer or lead engineer on this project. And so I'm not going to talk anymore. I just let this guy talk. I mean, he, this guy is involved in building it and knows more about it than I'll ever know. But, well, I'll uh, give you credit yeah, for, hook, for hooking us up with this guy. This is the guy. <clears throat> it is the guy. Yeah, he's, is the guy. he's smart. He's a smart individual. I, I want to add one thing. I do have some input on this conversation. And that is okay. I've had some pretty cool conversations with different high-level installers. I'm not going to mention names, but like top-shelf fabricators, you know, out there. And uh, they've had really good things to say about this product, especially when it came to trick situations that you were kind of referring to. So I'm, I'm curious to hear what Alan has to say about that. And when we say Alan, we, of course, mean Alan Hosebus, who is the senior engineer for Orca Manufacturing and Design, joining us today. Alan, welcome to CMA Industry Week. Howdy, gentlemen. How are you guys doing today? Uh, we are deep, I mean deep, into car audio chatter right now. Excellent. That sounds like a whole lot of fun to me. It, it's been a blast. Grant has been a, a gracious co-pilot and uh, sticking. You know, I wasn't sure if he'd be able to keep up. He's he's a little old, but buddy, we're, just getting um, warmed up. we're getting warmed up. Buddy. Oh, you're just getting warmed up. Did you yeah. down two Red Bulls in that break or? No, no. I, I'm on I'm on hard water. If I Perfect. start busting out the crown, you know it's time. To oh, geez. Okay. There we go. Let's go. So, Alan, uh, Nick Wingate talked you up. He said you got to tune in, Alan. He's going to have a really cool presentation on this Illusion Audio product. I am genuinely interested because I, I, I'm a little bit ashamed. I don't know as much as I should know about this product. But when I heard you were coming on, I said, now's the best time to get my learn on. Cool. Well, we try hard to solve problems, not just go to marketing. All right. Beautiful. So let's go ahead and put this up for you. And I'll let you take it away. All right. Um, welcome, gentlemen. Um, Illusion Audio is uh, designed in USA and manufactured in India. We, there are three separate product lines. In the big picture here, you see our carbon line, carbon fiber cones with neodymium magnets. Also, you see a kit here in the middle. The step below that, our mid-level, is the Lucent using polypropylene cones. And then the entry level is Electra, and it uses conventional ceramic magnets. So let's uh, charge forward, and we'll go into more detail on all these, including some of the cool engineering geeky stuff. All right, yeah. so we're gonna on, pass right over this side, but I can tell you that the main thing here is we're trying to do slim speakers without compromise. That is full X max, but shrink the package. And we shrink the package by going to neodymium magnets. And as you can see here, this is the motor on the front of the woofer. We do this on um, four inch through eight inch sizes. Hold on a second, Alan. I've got, a, I've got an image coming through here. I definitely Terrific. want to show. That looks like a five inch, and you can see the, the motor there. And if you at the edge there, you can see there's grooves on the side of that motor. That's actually a heat sink carved directly into the steel. So we double the surface area to reduce temp operating temperatures. Okay, so it's, you've taken the motor out from behind the driver and put it out in front of it. Correct. And this whole Correct. time, I thought that was a funny-looking tweeter that was a coaxial. <laughs> right. So you see on the back side, you only have the depth of what the spider needs for backward stroke. Gotcha. And there's a big aluminum mast attached to the back of the basket that holds the motor on the front side. So now you have a huge heat sink. And we can attest to that. Um, we've got a couple 
rockheads that have, uh, after a two-hour cruising session, as loud as they can take it, you can reach down and touch the voice coil, and it's still at room temperature. Really? Yeah, it's excellent cooling on these. So I can't recall any of these coming back with burned voice coils. It's always mechanical from overdriving them, usually with a crossover frequency set too low. <coughs> All right, so um, the carbon series, the key features, it's a woven carbon fiber cone, cast aluminum baskets. We talked about the inverted motor uh, using neodymium, beryllium copper dome tweeters, coincident point sources for the coaxials, and we're using a patented motor design called XBL with two magnetic gaps with uh, multiple Faraday rings. We, so they range from one Faraday ring to up to three day Faraday rings depending on the application. And there's extensive air ventilation to minimize any self noise. And we'll, we'll deep dive into all these features later on, okay? Okay. Okay, uh, first up, the coaxial series in the carbon line. They're available in a three inch, I got a separate slide, 3-inch, 4-inch, 5-inch, and 6-inch. The smaller series uses a 14-millimeter tweeter. See mounted right here in the center and the apex of the cone. So the cone, the woofer cone actually acts like a horn, a waveguide, to get the best possible frequency response. The big C6 uses the full 25-millimeter dome that we use in the component tweeters. And you can see we've got separate crossovers here because if you want this system to sound its best, you need equalization that's built into this passive crossover network. When you go full active, we'll give you all the details in a separate application. Hi, excellent. I've got a close up the crossover later on. We'll go over all the controls. Component systems available in 3 inch, 4 inch, 5 inch, 6 inch, and 8 inch. Uh, the 4 was specifically designed for the problem of mounting in the upper door panel of Mercedes and BMW. So it's very, very thin while still having a full four millimeters of X-Max. And to my knowledge, that's more than double of anything else in the industry at that X-Max level. Our six inch and the eight inch, they share the same motor with the one and a half inch voice coil. These guys have plus or minus seven millimeters of X-Max. The most I can find any place else is five and a half millimeters. And what's typical is three to three and a half. So if you've got double the X-Max, that means you can play six decibels louder. That's like having four times amplifier power. Oh, wow. Or to look at it a different way, if we can operate the speaker at one half of its X-Max, X-Max is defined as 10% distortion. At one half of X-Max, we're at 1% distortion. So why not listen at 1% distortion instead of 10% distortion? Uh, major advantages there. Hmm. Especially for your jazz and classical people that really appreciate that type of fidelity. Um, here's a close-up of the three-inch component with its tweeter and the coaxial. And this is uh, one of our most popular sellers because this guy is so compact, you can get it up into the A-pillars near the, near the base of the dash or in front of the doors. It's, it's really compact. You can see the, the motors on the backside that's come because of the packaging so that we could make it a, a coaxial. But you see, even the motor there, there's knurling on it to act as a heat sink to, to increase the surface area. It's a 88 millimeters diameter. That will fit into the dash holes of Chrysler's and, and other vehicles. The mounting hole is 75 millimeters. That will also fit into the hole uh, left over from that uh, factory uh, three and a half inch driver. Three, three and a half. They, they call, I see various advertising claims from two and a half to three but they're all pretty much the same size within a few millimeters. It's only 37 millimeters deep. And even this little guy, plus or minus four millimeter X max. Now I check carefully in the three inch market, the most anybody has is one millimeter. So that's four times the X max. Uh, we recommend a 300 Hertz, 12 decibel octave crossover. Uh, 300 Hertz is kind of a magic number for psychoacoustics because now we have nearly, we have all consonants and vowels coming out of a single driver. So that greatly improves your resolution, your fidelity. And uh, in the pro sound, we call it articulation of consonants. That is the ability to understand speech as clearly as possible. And uh, we make the C6 and C8 available a la carte. So you can choose which one fits your car and then combine it with these drivers as your mid-range tweeters. 
this is the C8. Now, if you look at the back side of it, we have a new basket that's very, very slim. This started shipping last year. Uh, very compact. Now, if you add a spacer exactly one inch thick or 25 millimeters, this will drop into a factory six and a half inch hole. Of course, you'll have to do some door panel work, but at least you know it'll fit the steel of the car. And uh, uh, deep base response. There's a lot of cars out there where you can't have a subwoofer like a Ferrari, uh, sub Corvettes, Miatas. This guy goes down to minus three decibel at around uh, 50 hertz. So it goes as deep as subwoofers, but it's designed for free air use and you need either a door or a deck. Um, when you're going full active, we would recommend a crossover just above the notch frequency of your car, which is going to be something around 75, 80 hertz area. If you don't have a sub, you can take it all the way down. I would recommend a uh, active uh, high pass filter at around 25 hertz just to, to remove the deepest bass of the hip hop music. But mm. pop rock, classical jazz, no problem with that type of bass. Subwoofers in the carbon series. We have a front motor, 10 inch and 12 inch that are slim. And then we have the monsters, uh, rear motor on 10s and 12s. Now the, the C10 here, we've got a 10 millimeter X max. The 12 is a 12 millimeter X max. This guy, 18 millimeters X max and 18 millimeters X max. So they really go. Um, here's something interesting for you though. All 10 inch models of every line is designed to work in a three quarter inch cubic foot box that's 21 liters and tuned to approximately the same minus three decibel point around 42 to 45 hertz every 12 inch model is designed to go to one cubic foot or 28 liters and tune to the neighborhood of 40 to 42 hertz so we make it very easy for your applications and um again all carbon fiber cones these are still neo magnets they're on the back side so that we can get the extreme x max Now we'll move to the midline series. This is the Lucent. We're using the exact same cast aluminum baskets. See the front motors. Con con conventional type of voice coil design though. So now we drop back to around four millimeters X max. Um, XBL lets us almost double the X max and cut the distortion more than half. Uh, these use a um, mica filled black polypropylene cone. Uh, a variation of the same tweeter with a different dome. Uh, in this case, the dome is aluminum magnesium, whereas in the carbon series, it's beryllium copper. Uh, they have a cast aluminum heat sink on the backside with a rear air chamber, so we get a low resonance frequency. And same type of coincident point source design uh, with different uh, components, but this built in the same chassis and the same crossover network tuned appropriately for the drivers. Uh, rubber surrounds were used everywhere and a uh, Konex Spider. Konex was specifically developed for the application of, of uh, spiders. Now it's closely related to the same chemistry family as Kevlar, but designed to have a much higher flex life. So it's, it is indeed uh, fireproof. And again, extensive of air ventilations. There's only two coaxial models in this line, a five inch, and a six inch. And in this case, uh, both of these drivers are using a aluminum magnesium dome. <clears throat> oh, uh, let me go back. See the crossovers? The color has changed on the silk screening and that's how we identify what product line the crossover goes with. Components, again, just two sizes, a five inch and a six inch. Uh, these have become really popular with power sports and motorcycles because of the, the waterproofness. And two subwoofer models, both slims. They, they use the same basket as the slims in the carbon series. Uh, the 10 inch now has a eight millimeter X max and the 12 inch has a 10 millimeter X max. That's because we're using the conventional voice coil. Still near the magnets. Those and now, those subs real quick, Alan, all the, all the, whether it's a carbon series or the Lucent series subwoofers, I mean, don't let the looks of that inverted magnet fool you. These things absolutely bang. I mean, this is not a, uh, an inverted shallow subwoofer like you see from other brands. This is, this thing actually delivers serious output for, for, for the design they have because of that cone shape. 
you don't have that shallow bass sound that I would refer to from some. Uh, oh, other trust me, I've got I've got that. so many questions here, um, <clears throat> and yeah, okay, we're gonna let all right. Alan do his thing. We're gonna circle back. Okay. Yeah, it's all going to be about everything he talked about here. Uh, right. Just real quick, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. We, I know we had a message come through. Illusion, just as I should have mentioned this in the beginning, Illusion is still part of Orca, which is part of Moscone Gladden family, right? Correct. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Please um, continue. We tune all of our subwoofers differently than the competition. Uh, most of the subwoofers in the market are tuned for a minus three decibel seal box in the. 50 hertz to 55 hertz region, we tune for 40 hertz to 45 hertz. Uh, we'd like to have ideally a minus three of 40 hertz in a sealed box because then your car is the acoustical equivalent to that. So it actually starts boosting the bass at 12 decibels per octave. So in a sealed box, minus three at 40 hertz in the car becomes minus three decibel at 12 hertz. You can't do that with a vented box. It's because of the acoustical gain of the vehicle. So that's why we design these things, tune these things to feel small parameters and the moving mass. And we're doing that. We're getting that type of bass despite the smaller boxes because we have appropriate moving mass on the cones. Mm. Uh, in fact, if you flip these loosens over, you'll see a big whack of steel on the back side of the cone as a mass ring and stiffening agent. It's shaped exactly like the cone. And so the first one third of the cone is actually steel behind this um, polypropylene. In the case of the carbon ones, uh, the cones are really thick carbon fiber laminated to paper to get the total mass and a combination of the different stiffnesses for uh, strain and damping. Okay, entry level, our electrical electro series, um, these subwoofers were actually originally designed for studio monitor use. So those are very stringent performance applications uh, for distortion, loudness, and flatness of frequency response. And then uh, to go from the studio to the car, we simply changed from a paper cone to a polypropylene cone, but kept the rest of it. So in this case, the entire line, it's an injection molded polypropylene cone, so it's variable thickness, thick at the center, progressively getting thin to the edge, so you can tune the breakup characteristics. And then it's a vapor deposited titanium on the front side. And that is specifically to protect the underlying plastic material from ultraviolet light, the sun. So the, the polypropylene never gets brittle over time. We're using steel baskets with a powder coating instead of liquid paint. So we have better rust resistance. Same high quality rubber surrounds. We're using a poly cotton spider that is polyester fibers blended into cotton. So that gives you roughly 15 times the life of a cotton only spider. When we go to Connex in the upper line, that's roughly 100 times the life of a cotton spider. Uh, a typical cotton spider, if I was to run it to suspension maximum, which is louder than you should be playing it, uh, it will last uh, in that power test 12 hours best case. The poly cotton will easily go seven days. And Konex, I've run the things over 30 days, 24 hours a day, 24 seven, at suspension max. Stop the test, no damage, still within a uh, field small parameter. So Konex is a major, major improvement. Um, the tweeters, same motor design as the upper two ones. But in this case, we've eliminated the rear chamber to make it smaller, and we're using a conventional aluminum dome where the middle one gets aluminum magnesium and the top gets beryllium copper. So we, we try to keep the family all the same, so we have the same sonic signatures. So if you have to mix and match components where you got carbon in the front, but for budget, you have to have electrode in the back, we can still get the same distortion signatures and um, frequency response signatures. So the system can blend together because you don't need any disparate phase issues and group delay issues to mess up a sound stage so you can never ever arrive to a sound stage because it's so difficult to fix it without extensive DSP work. So let's just design it correctly from the get-go. And all of these use ceramic motors, budget-wise, and an extended T-pole so we have proper heat sinking and proper linear magnetic blunts. Uh, lots of more models here. We're uh, started at four inch, five, six, a five by seven for your OEM needs, and a six by nine. 20 millimeter dome, 
on these three, one inch dome on these two, because there's more room to get a dome in front of that cone. And components, four inch, five inch, and six inch. We chose not to make an eight inch model because um, when people go to eights, they want a premium system, not an entry level system. And notice the crossover covers, uh, now they're all black. But on the inside, they're all the same as far as the schematic of the circuit. Now the actual parts values change, but by having the same schematic, we guarantee that the phase response is identical across the entire line. And that's what's important to your imaging when you're mixing and matching. Two subwoofers, a 10 inch and a 12 inch. Now these both have uh, 14 millimeters of X max, which is pretty strong for an entry level. And again, our um, 10 inch is minus three decibels around 40 Hertz, or 43 Hertz. And the 12 is minus three decibel at around 40 Hertz. And now we can deep dive a little bit more into the technologies. Looks like we, yeah, we got enough time here. Okay, so we already talked about the front near and motors and the fact that we've carved a heat sink in, into it. We'll drop into the brilliant copper tweeters, coincident tweeters, details of XBL and Faraday rings, carbon fiber cones, crossovers, and the subwoofers. So here we go. Here's a close up of the Carillion Copper Tweeter. We chose Carillion Copper because at your house, there's a critical safety device called a circuit breaker. All the power of your house and in your car has to flow through these circuit breakers. The magic material that makes that circuit breaker work is Beryllium Copper. It uh, essentially turns copper into a spring that doesn't break. So it has extremely long life. Uh, and uh, because it's still malleable, you can form it into a dome by stretching, unlike pure beryllium. Uh, pure beryllium is pretty brittle. It's basically like glass. Beryllium copper is like a hammer, literally. You can pound the smack out of the thing and it just keeps taking it. It's really cool. Um, but you gain um, the dampening properties of, alum of the um, copper so, and the hardness properties of the beryllium. So it's a really nice in-between. The entire tweeter is designed to be a heat sink from the dome to the voice coil to the air chamber on the back side, which is a cast aluminum heat sink. Uh, there's extensive venting. The, the back side of the magnet is vented from the voice coil so we don't get air bubbles forming in the fuel fluid. Uh, a lot of tweeters, when you turn them up loud, you start, well, if you run a sine wave, so you can actually hear what's going on, not music, but a sine wave, the fuel fluid sounds sounding like sizzling bacon, hmm. literally. And what that is, is air bubbles forming in the fuel fluid. Now, first, you don't want the noise. Secondly, air does not conduct heat like oil does. So we don't want the air bubbles. We put an air vent in there to fix that problem. We're using uh, the same tinsel wires that are used in uh, professional studio monitor compression drivers. So high power handling capacity there with long stroke, uh, 1100 hertz resonance frequency. And uh, it's designed to just drop it in and, and go. It has a very flat, smooth frequency response. Uh, I've heard a lot of comments where people say, well, I, I'm, I'm looking at these tweeters and I see metal, but I hear silk. What is going on here? And that's because of how we've tailored the frequency response and the fact that the copper content has much higher damping than a pure aluminum or a pure beryllium. And you have a much higher breakup frequency than, than silk because it's physically stiffer. So you get the best of both worlds. Our passive crossovers are set to 3000 Hertz, which is lower than your typical tweeter. We can do that because of all the, the heat sinking. And that just helps get you more sound stage on the dash when your woofers are down in the door. Here's a close up of the C6CX with the tweeter located where the dust cap would normally be. Uh, as I explained before, the reason you want to do this is that the woofer cone becomes a horn, a waveguide for the tweeter. So now at 30 degrees off the axis and 45 degrees off axis, the frequency response of the tweeter stays consistent. And most importantly, we're putting the crossover frequency at the wavelength, not where the frequency response is flat us, but actually where the wavelength is that guarantees as you go off the axis through the crossover network, you never get a hole. 
most, if you were to run the crossover frequency too high on com component systems, you always get a hole in the frequency spots because the woofer is too directional. So by taking advantage of the horn loading, we completely changed the, the physics of the problem. And it makes it very easy. So whenever possible, I like coincident drivers because you, you're never in front of the speaker. You're always listening at 30 degrees off axis or 45 degrees off axis. And this is especially important in a car because the speaker in the left door and the speaker in the right door or the left dash and the right dash, you can just with the eyeballs, you can see you've got a completely different acoustical problems on the left side and the right side of the car. This makes it super easy for equalization and time alignment because the tweeter and the woofer are one unity source of sound. So I can't say that enough. It just makes life easy because you eliminate the number one problem with putting the drivers in the car. Premium crossovers. This big red guy here is a polypropylene capacitor. The coils are air core with co pure copper wire. We have tweeter loudness adjustments. Uh, there's a jumper here. You see here closely, it says minus one decibel, minus two decibel, minus three decibel. And now you can mix and match. If you want minus four, you turn on the three and the one. If you want five, you turn on the three and the two. If you want six, you turn on three, four, five, six. So we have seven one decibel steps. So you can make that tweeter exactly what you need. Uh, most capacitor crossovers have a switch. So you have a choice, plus three or minus three, or in too much or not enough. This lets you get exactly what you want. This yellow disc over here is called a poly switch. It's a, a temperature sensitive, res automatically resettable fuse. So if you run your amplifier in distortion, this is gonna turn on and go to infinite resistance and your tweeter is gonna turn off. And then it will quickly cool off and the tweeter will start playing again. If you keep the amplifier under clipping, this will never turn on. So in most car applications, it's not an issue. If it's rock and roll with fuzz guitar, it's not an issue because that type of distortion is very different than the clipping of an amplifier. On a motorcycle, this is a godsend because you stop blowing up tweeters. And then right here we have a switch for biamp. So you, you can see tweeter input, woofer input, woofer output, tweeter output. So a lot of people like to run passive biamps. I don't know why. I'd go for the full active, but we have you, this option for you if you need it. And these three resistors are tied to these switches here for adjusting the tweeter loudness. Now I want to point out again, every model uses this exact same looking crossover. What will change is the value of this capacitor and the value of these two coils to match the frequency response needs of the speaker. And then of course the poly switch changes depending on which tweeter is being used. So that uh, makes it very simple for manufacturing and it makes it really simple for the installer trying to tune its active crossovers and equalizers. Carbon fiber cone material. We're using carbon, woven carbon fiber, and if you can hear, see here the weaving, but see these white holes in the middle? Every carbon has this type of thing when it's open and weaved. So what we've done, um, a, we laminate to the backside um, polyurethane tape. You'll see it in Formula One racing. The Formula One car crashes and they get it back to the pits and they pull out what they call the helicopter tape. Tape the carbon back together and out it goes back to the racetrack. Well, that's the film that we're using on the back side of this carbon fiber. So, because we need to make it airtight, but we also need a very strong, tough material and high damping because carbon fiber alone has poor damping. You need to add damping to it. Uh, carbon fiber has, of course, it's per weight, it's the stiffest and it's the strongest in tensile. So we get a, a very ideal um, synergy here where we're, we're using stiffness and damping together. So we get a sound and a frequency response that's more similar to paper, but with the extra extension and extra micro details of the strength of the carbon fiber. Uh, front magnet orifers here, you can <coughs> clearly see where we've cut the heat sink directly in the steel to pull the heat out of the voice coil. And um, that's critical because not just for blowing up a speaker, because you actually have to get the voice coil up to something in the neighborhood of 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, 400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than you're cooking food to de destroy the adhesives in the voice coil.
But before you've gotten there, um, along the way, the resistance of the voice coil is increased. As the resistance increases, so does the, re the resistance. So now it takes more power to get the same loudness. It's also known as compression. Um, in pro sound, when they give you a power rating on the woofer, what they're actually doing is they're increasing the power until the voice coil has got so hot that the loudness of the speaker is three decibels less than its specification. So we've lost, you now we need twice as much power for the same loudness because the voice coil got hot. Well, let's just eliminate that problem altogether, right? That's uh, doubling your amplifier power for free and who doesn't like that? <laughs> and also, the heat is now on the outside of the speaker cabinet. It's on the outside of the door. So we have very good cooling air and very good con convection. This is the eight inch driver. So we're looking straight in from the back. You can see how open the spider is. The lead wires completely reflection free. So we don't have any airflow issues. Uh, the voice coil is completely open here. That's the aluminum mass that holds the motor on the front side. So again, this eight inch driver, we got plus and minus seven millimeters of X-Max where the competition is half of that. So we did not have to compromise any performance to get our loudness. Also compared to a conventional slim woofer that has the motor in the backside, they have to use a very shallow cone. Well, as you make the cone shallower, you change the frequency that it breaks up. This particular eight inch driver is flat to around uh, 4,500 hertz. I see a lot of conventional six inch drivers that can barely make 33,000, 3,200. As soon as you go to a slim type driver, because the cone angle is so shallow, they don't even make a thousand hertz and they just accept a big hole in the frequency response between a thousand hertz and wherever the treater crosses over, typically around 4,500 hertz. So that's not a good solution. Let's just eliminate the problem, right? Why not? Uh, this is the biggest subwoofer, the 10 inch and the 12 inch XL series, 18 millimeters of linear X max. That's at 10% distortion. Uh, all X max go to your data sheets. Whenever they say X max, make sure it says plus and minus by physics definition, that's 10% distortion. But that doesn't tell you the whole story of what's happening at half volume or at three quarters volume. And that's the magic of the motor we'll get to in a little bit while we have an XBL. This is on the front side, you see carbon fiber and on the back side, you see paper and the, the dust cap is exactly like the cone. When you do the knuckle test, this sounds very dead like a pure paper cone. Same thing with the dust cap. It does not ring, but the, the carbon fiber, it gives you extreme tensile strength. So it, the radial modes are controlled and it's the radial mode that leads to the high frequency limit. And then the paper being extra thick adds to the bending modes. That would be from the inside to the outside, but it also adds critical damping. In the smaller drivers, six and eight inch and smaller, we use the, the helicopter tape, the polyurethane film, because we need very, very low mass. But in a subwoofer, we need high mass to get the tuned resonance frequency in the size of box that you want. So if you want a, a one cubic foot box instead of a two cubic foot box, we have to double the mass of the cone to get that necessary resonance frequency. Here's the amazing part. If we got a 10 inch and 12 inch subwoofer that will check this out. It's flat to 1500 Hertz. I see an awful lot of woofers on the market that can't even get to a hundred Hertz at minus three decibel because the polypropylene cones start flexing. And there's some big names out there at 1500 Hertz. We could cross over to a pro sound um, compression driver. But you can see if we're, we're only using a small percentage of the capacity of the driver, we've got the clearest possible sound. And that 1500 Hertz is only limited by the breakup of the fat rubber surround. If we had a, a narrower surround, uh, like you'd have on a base mid range, uh, this driver actually goes out to almost 3000 Hertz between the cone design and the extremely low inductance of the motor. And we'll get into big detail on that a little bit later. So we're using, um, Faraday rings in order to get that low distortion and that very low inductance to get the high frequency response. Um, another thing you may ask, why 
what would I want a driver to go to 1500 hertz if I'm going to cross over at 700 at 75 hertz? Well, let's consider distortion. Second harmonic distortion is 75 times 2, 150. Third harmonic distortion is 75 times 3. Um, you can hear distortion all the way up to the tenth harmonic. So if you're going to play at 75 hertz, you'd ideally like a driver that's flat to 750 hertz if you want to reproduce a square wave like you would have on, say, a fuzz guitar or certain organ notes. Now, you, you would think, well, I've got a crossover network removing that. Yes, you do. But if you do not want to have any slew rate limit, this is what you need to do to, uh, if you want to 100% reproduce the music that's presented to the voice coil. And that's what we want, a faithful reproduction of what was received at the voice coil. You see in the back side, there's air vents here. So the voice coil has ventilation. Uh, this is from behind the dust caps. So we're pumping air through the inside of the steel network. And then there's additional vents here on the back side of the spider. So every place we're moving air for cooling and we don't have any trapped air that causes noise and resonance. All 10 inch models, three quarter cubic inch, uh, three quarter cubic foot or 21 liters minus three decibel at 46 Hertz. And the 12 inch, one cubic foot, 28 liters is minus three decibel at 42 Hertz. Now, if you want to go to the minimum size box, all 10s can drop to a half a cubic foot. All 12s can drop to three quarters of a cubic foot. And these cutoff frequencies will move up about five Hertz. Count of volumes. Uh, there's the, all the details. Uh, here's the a really interesting one. Let's look at X max alone. And as I told you, X max is at 10% distortion. To get to plus or minus 14 millimeters on the E10 and the E12, it takes 300 watts. Uh, L10, only seven millimeters, so it'll only take 250 watts. C10, 10 millimeters, 400 watts. C10 XL, like our, happened to our X-Max, we went from 10 to 18, and now we go from 400 watts to 1,000 watts at 10% distortion. And the motor, the we pretty much mirror the same amount of X-Max and watts required to reach that X-Max on 10 inch and 12 inch here just scaled for the size of the box that's put in. XBL dual magnetic gap. We're going to go back in this real detail on our next slide, but it's patented technology using two magnetic gaps. It allows you to have for the same size magnet, more efficiency, lighter weight, and more X max. And uh, the distortion drops dramatically when you go to this type of technology, which you cannot very easily duplicate with any conventional motor technology. Um, there is one technology that can equal it, but at more than three times the expense. So this actually saves quite a bit of cost if your target is to be small, compact, and have the, the loudest possible sound for a given size of magnet and voice coil. Yeah, intermodulation distortion drops dramatically. You will not find an intermodulation distortion on any speaker web web site or specification sheet because they don't want to talk about it. Um, it's extremely high on most speakers because they have not done anything about it. We have. I'll get in details on that and I'll show you why. Um, very low inductance and that is probably the most important thing in the distortion. So here's what XBL looks like. That's a steel pole. That's a steel pole. This is an aluminum ring for Faraday. Some models also have an aluminum ring on the top side for Faraday and another aluminum ring here for Faraday. All the Faraday does is it reduces inductance and keeps the inductance linear. This is the neodymium magnet on this particular motor. And I'll show you how XBL works over here in this animation. So here you see the top gap, the bottom gap, and see the voice call here? It's halfway into that gap. Now when I stroke that, see how far that voice coil is moving? I'm going from this edge of the voice coil halfway into the top gap to the top edge of the voice coil halfway into that gap. Now in the middle, I'm half in the top and half in the bottom. So despite the very short voice coil, I get extremely long X-Max. The short voice coil means low inductance, 
low moving mass. Inductance is what is the number one thing that limits your high frequency response, your punch, your impact, perceived speed. Uh, two things affect the speed, the rise time, which is the inductance, and the decay time, which is the cue of the box. And you can control the cue of the box, but you're stuck with whatever the inductance from the speaker has. So this is the most important thing. And inductance is also the single biggest influence on intermodulation distortion. That nobody this, wants to talk about. Exactly. But this, the XBL is how we fix the first harmonic, or the yeah, second harmonic and third harmonic. And I'll, let's get to that next. Oh, that should have advanced for us. There we go. Okay, what does XBL do precisely? It affects harmonic distortion, which is clarity, compression, QTS, and BL strength. Now, um, amazingly, the data sheet on every speaker tells you how the speaker performs at one watt. Do you ever use a speaker at one watt? You probably use it at 100 watts or 1,000 watts, but never one watt. Is, so. one, watt, is one watt even audible? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, in your home stereo, if you're uh, normal conversation, okay, normal conversation, that's about one watt of power. Oh, okay, there you go. Okay. okay. So uh, if you were to take a conventional speaker design and do it the best possible way, you get this graph I have here on the left side. And third harmonic distortion, which is pretty ugly, means you're produ for, you put in 50 hertz, and the speaker reproduces 50 hertz and 150 hertz. Second harmonic, the speaker produces 50 hertz and 100 hertz. That's what harmonics are. You would like to hear the pure 50 hertz tone. You don't want to hear 150 hertz tone. If I have a woofer that's behind me, and theoretically bass is non-directional, but, but it's producing 150 hertz, despite my active crossover sit at 50 hertz, I can tell there's a subwoofer behind me. So if you want that subwoofer to be out in your hood, where it belongs in the sound stage, you got to get rid of the distortion. And this is happening regardless of what you crossover sit to, because the speaker itself produces that sound. So specifically, this is a graph where I'm right here is at zero millimeters. Uh, this is a measure of the motor strength. As this speaker goes forward, the motor becomes less strong, meaning the efficiency is dropping the farther I move from center. But when I go backwards, it's actually becoming louder for a while, and then it starts dropping. So these curves on the end are your third harmonic distortion because it's unsymmetric. Now you see a tilt at the top. See it's at an angle? That's your second harmonic distortion. So we can fix that by changing how the steel is formed and the magnetic flux. So here on the left is what Illusion Audio Carbon is all about. Notice we have a completely flat line across the top. So in this region, our second harmonic distortion is close to zero, about 0.1%. And then at the extremes, of course, it rolls off. But notice the left and the right are identical. So we only have um, second harmonic distortion. here. We are not generating any third harmonic distortion any place in this curve. It's essentially zero. And of course, third harmonic makes it very easy to ghost image where the speaker is where you don't want it to be despite your time alignment and your crossover settings. So uh, I talked, these both drivers are on the data sheet, 15 millimeters X max, but you can see they're going to sound very different in the distortion characteristics. Um, this speaker at 1% distortion, okay, 15, 5, 70%, so about one third of its travel is available at less than 1% distortion. This guy here, we're about 80% of the travel at 1% distortion. So you see the speaker can play significantly louder at a perceived low distortion. Now let's take the next step. Intermodulation distortion. That's the really ugly stuff that no one wants to talk about. Intermodulation distortion, the best way I can feel it, <clears throat> you have ever stood in front of a fan and talked into it. You hear the voice go, wah, 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 wah. Okay, so what you hear, you hear the high frequency bouncing off the fan blades and then not bouncing off the blade as it goes by. 
So that change of frequency response, intermodulation distortion. Modulation means the 50 hertz signal is moving the cone at big max max, but you're trying to produce another frequency at the same time, say a, a 500 hertz tone. So as the woofer moves in and out, that mid-range loudness changes. In the case of a subwoofer, it's not quite as critical, but in your, your um, six and a half inch driver in the door, you, you know, you're taking that thing to suspension max and you're still expecting it to produce treble frequency. So you did, you know, a, a horrible racket that you'd rather not listen to. So by shaping the steel properly and then adding the Faraday rings, we can fix this problem. Here is the best possible design of a conventional speaker. This is at the center travel. So you can see as we move forward, the inductance decreases. And as we go backwards, the inductance increases. Let's look at this a different way. Take a crossover network and you put an inductor on your woofer. As we go forward, it becomes an air core. As we go backward, it becomes an iron core. Now, what would happen if you take a crossover network and constantly change that coil from an air core to an iron core while the music's playing? You probably wouldn't like that, but that's how all woofers work. Hmm. So let's fix it. We put in some Faraday rings and shape the steel properly so that we get a flat linear line. Uh, notice in both cases, these drivers are both 15 millimeters X max on the data sheet. And the data sheet doesn't tell you what, at all what's happening with the intermodulation distortion. Pretty cool. And now this is an extended T-pole as best you can do. Um, I can make things a lot worse, but I can't make them better than that unless you go to XBL. The only thing that can compete with XBL is what's called underhung voice coils. You'll only find that in some really expensive high-end speakers and a few studio monitors. But to reproduce this with an underhung type uh, requires more than double the ma mass and more than double the strength of the motor of the magnet. So you're looking at um, almost three times total cost if you were to go that type of technology route, which was available from the, the 1940s. XBL was patented in the early 2000s. Hmm. So it's a big leap forward. Um, also, uh, let me just drop back. Just so you know, Alan, we have about five minutes. So if there's any key points after that that you want to roll to, just to yes, give you a okay. second time. All right, thank you. I'll move forward then. With XBL, the voice coil always remains inside of cold steel. So we have a heat sink over the entire length. When we get voice speakers back with burned up voice coils, it's always the front side of the voice coil that's out in the air that burns, usually not the back side that's inside the cold steel. So with XBL, we keep a constant temperature with the full stroke. Coming in 2021, later in the year, is a new product line for entry level. It'll be very slim using ceramic magnets. And note right here, this copper colored thing, <coughs> That's a Faraday ring to get us a linear impedance curve and reduced intermodulation distortion. You won't find that in any else, anyone else's speakers, especially that price point. And it'll be a full family of line lineup. Uh, let's skip over packaging. Uh, every new dealer gets a display. And this is a display that we have available. It's uh, 50 inches wide, 20 inches deep, 60 inches tall. It's on three inch caster, so you can roll around your showroom Take it outside for your parking lot sales. Uh, the front baffle is 25 millimeters thick, so it's and each driver has an individual chamber, so it's a properly tuned vented box in all cases. And we, we chose vented box because in the big showroom, we're trying to simulate being in a small car. So the vented box gives us approximately the same frequency response of what you would have inside the car. Room for two amplifiers in the front and switches. And this is a lighted sign up here at the top. So you can see we've got six, six and a half. This comes as a six and a half inch hole and then you cut. You choose, do I want a six and a half, a five by eight or a six, six by nine here? And then tens here and, and twelves here. All four subwoofers are on independent switches <clears throat> right here. So you can play one or two at a time, whatever you need. Uh, several magazine reviews. Here's some looks at the factory. This nice young lady makes all the voice coils. This is the machine shop. These here are tweeter domes. This is the aluminum domes going through the press. And this is our carbon fiber press, laminating the carbon and paper and curing it. 
Uh, some it's more nice production. to see people making things. Yes. You yes. know what I mean? And, and I affectionately call these these grandmas, live, look at their age, they're grandmas. They've been doing this since they were in their 20s. They are literally analog robots. They really wow. understand their craft. <clears throat> They've been, you know, this company started back in the late 70s. Uh, and it was started by a Danish company that you may know. Uh, it was called Peerless Audio. Peerless, yeah. Yes. Um, but that's who started the company. Peerless has been around a long time. And they started this company in India. Then the company in India went independent because they wanted to build their own product lines. But they were originally supplying all the, the different things. Um, lo, note the floors. Nice marble floors. See how shiny they are? Mm -hmm. Dirt is important. You don't want dirt in your glue joints. So if you got dust floating in the air, you're going to have suboptimum glue joints. So we don't want that. We also don't want dirt in the voice coils when they be assembled. These little blue gauges here is what sits the voice coil perfectly in the center when they're being glued up. And this is the uh, Electra production line. And you'll see some of these faces. These ladies here, the only job they do is tweeters. That's their specialty. And uh, that's how the shop is divided up. All right. Alan, I'm going to pull off the presentation. I've got a couple That's things all I, I want to, Good. I want a couple things I want to go through with you real quick because we only have two or three minutes left here. Um, there's a lot of information there. I'm, I'm definitely going to have to watch that back because my mind was so focused on two or three key points, my takeaway from this grant. And I'd like, like you to comment on what I'm about to say here. First of all, I think it's a very unique product line. And when at the top of the hour, Grant was mentioning how, you know, it's it's this is not the product line that's going into every store. There's going to be a select group of dealers that would have access to something like this. And rightfully so, because I think where I see uh, the strengths of this line, obviously the engineering behind it is, you know, next level. Uh, and yourself, I mean, what a great, wow. That was a ton of knowledge. And you, you it, it's obvious that there's a passion and there's a lot of thought and detail with everything behind the design and the engineering. But what that tells me from a dealer standpoint is if you want a, a product that caters to that type of clientele for certain specifications, you know, the shallow mount is one thing, but also, you know, that enjoys any well-engineered product. Because at the end of the day, there is that customer that appreciates well-engineered product. There is there is a customer that just comes in, yeah, can you change my speakers? They're not loud enough. But then there's that customer that says, hey, listen, I'm not really happy with these speakers. What is there in the market? And explain to me why I should get spend my money on these ones. Well, there's a lot of talking points. I guess is that's what I, that's where I'm going to. So Grant, that's what I have to say. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, this Alan's obviously puts a lot of passion into what he what he does, and there's a there's a wealth of knowledge. I mean, I've watched his presentation, I think four or five times, and I still get blown away with how much stuff wow. they put into these speakers. I mean, it's it's a lot of care, a lot of it's a company that gives a you know you know what about their product it's not just slapping a logo on it and calling it a day it's there's there's a real thought there's a real reason why they do this stuff and if you ever listen to this product you can hear it i mean the, the carbon series speakers are phenomenal uh, amazing how much detail you get out of those tweeters how low they play the mid bass attack uh, i've sat in a car at um, knowledge fest last year where I think it was a Scion or something like that that uh, mm -hmm. Sage had built and had an eight inch driver in the door where the stock six inch was. I mean, that, it's it, the, the stuff you can do with this product. That's why I said it's a secret weapon. It, it really is. It's not it's not the uh, most famous brand name in the planet, but it, they've got some really, really, really solid products. And we're, we're super glad. I mean, you're talking about you know $400 to $1,200 range, it, it covers you know, what most people are in the market for, for good quality products. Beautiful. All right. Well, can't thank you enough, Alan. I know we're going to have you back shortly as you take off one shirt and put on the other. But uh, <laughs> we do appreciate your sure. expertise. And He's then, been up since 6 a.m. this morning, by the way. He, he was on another call with some other supplier this morning at 6 a.m. So wow. Alan's a trooper, man. He's a trooper. You're a beast. Well, well, we'll have you back shortly. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, was there something you want to mention about some – what do we say at the bottom – so was oh, there, a there, there may have been conflict? something. Yeah, now because um, anyone that was on the chat, um, we're going to do a random draw, and I'm just going to ask him for a number, and uh, they're going to give us a set of uh, C3 uh, S components, so the three-inch tweet uh, components. They're giving a set of those away, so perfect for your A-pillar application or up in your dash. 
So damn, are, son. Eight hundred dollar set of speakers, man. That's a nice giveaway. Thanks, Nalika. It's really awesome. So anyone that was on the chat, um, we'll do a random draw later. I'll ask Nalika for a number, and then we'll we'll pull that. Sounds good. Well, that's another one wrapped up. We got we got to bounce because uh, we got to come right back and do it with another brand. So thank you so okay. much, Grant. That's right. There you have it, guys, and that was a in depth, and I do mean in depth overview for Illusion Audio, courtesy of Trends Electronics. That's it for this one. I'm your host, Ben Wu. Until next time, we connect.